Hello, I'm Michael Peterson, director of the documentary film Damned to Extinction. And I'm Stephen Hawley, writer of the film. You know, oftentimes, good writing is just about making connections. And one writer who was pretty good at that, John Muir, observed that when we try to pick apart a thing by itself, we find it hits to everything else in the universe. One of the reasons Michael and I started making documentary films together is a mutual love of rivers. One of the things we love about rivers, they're a constant reminder of Muir's observation, of the interconnectedness of so many things, including two animals that begin their lives a thousand miles apart, the southern resident orcas and the Chinook salmon of the Columbia River Basin. Unfortunately, four obsolete dams on the lower Snake River are breaking that connection. The largest tributary of the Columbia is the Snake River, and a huge portion of the Snake Basin is protected in one of the largest wild areas remaining in the lower 48 states over four million acres of wilderness, protecting thousands of miles of pristine streams and rivers, once provided half of all the Chinook salmon in the Columbia Basin, some two to four million fish every year. But now, these four dams have all but eliminated access for salmon to these wild rivers. Without these salmon, orcas a thousand miles away in the Pacific Ocean are starving. The southern resident orcas are a very unique population. During the summer months, they inhabit the area known as the Salish Sea. This is the area around Seattle, Washington, and up north towards Vancouver Island, British Columbia. The southern residents eat almost exclusively Chinook salmon. The Columbia River system was once the largest producer of Chinook salmon in the entire world and fed these orcas for most of the year. I'll let you in on a secret. These orcas can talk. <laughs> Now, they don't speak English, but they do communicate in a unique series of clicks, squeaks, and squeals. <laughs> this language evolved as these orcas evolved to hunt and eat Chinook salmon. Both language and their hunting strategies are actually skills that are taught by older orcas to young ones. And both language and their ability to learn and teach are signs of a really sophisticated intelligence. Orca brains are highly evolved. Now, think of this. You out there watching and listening, us, synapses popping in that hefty homo sapien cranium of yours, you have three lobes in your human brain. Orcas have a fourth lobe in theirs. And researchers think that it's dedicated to the processing of emotion. These orcas are incredibly social. They have close-knit family networks, and led by orca mothers, they stay together for the span of their lives. In the past, the average lifespan of the southern resident orca was similar to that of humans. A much-beloved southern resident nicknamed Granny was their leader and matriarch until recently. She was estimated to be 105 when she finally died. Unfortunately, southern resident lifespans are getting much shorter. Very few babies are born, and even fewer of those survive past their very first year. In 1995, there were 98 southern residents. Today, we're down to just 73. The reason? They're starving to death. The Chinook salmon they relied on for thousands of years is disappearing. This past year, fewer than 70,000 wild spring Chinook returned to the Columbia Basin. A little more than a century ago, Millions would gather where the river meets the ocean. And from here, they'd begin a journey of up to a thousand miles back to the water of their birth, finding their way often to just within a stone's throw of the very spot where they were born. After that long swim home, a female Chinook would lay her eggs about the color of sunrise and the size of a coffee bean in a shallow depression that she digs with her tail in the river bottom. One to two months later, these eggs would hatch, and the resulting juvenile salmon would make their way back out to the ocean on high water in the springtime. Without these annual salmon returns, it's, it's more than just the southern residents they're going without. These um, salmon fed more than 100 different species, including humans. They also provided a huge boost to the forest by giving nutrients to the giant cedar and Douglas fir. Salmon face the same pressures affecting fisheries all over the world. The two biggest factors are overfishing and habitat loss. Again, the Columbia was, until recently, the world's most prolific producer of Chinook salmon. But it's been nearly destroyed by an especially nasty strain of habitat loss, the construction of dams. From 1920 to 1980, the United States built 50,000 dams. During that time, the Columbia River system became one of the most dammed rivers on Earth. 
It's a myth that dams are a clean, renewable energy source. Dams are a factory in the middle of a river. When they leak oil, as they often do, that oil goes straight into the water. They take a free-flowing river and convert it into a series of stagnant reservoirs. Temperatures in these reservoirs rise to salmon-killing levels. Predator fish like bass and pike minnow thrive, and these predator fish feed on the outgoing juvenile salmon. And let's not forget, these dams are driving orcas and salmon into extinction. That's not something we can call renewable. About 30 years ago, some people realized that we might have overdone it during the dam building craze. And since then, almost 1,500 dams around the country have been demolished. And the results have been overwhelmingly positive. And here's one quick success story. This bear is proof that dam removal works. She's hunting Chinook, not on some remote stream in Alaska, but on a small stream about an hour north of Sacramento, California, Butte Creek. Now, here in the 1990s, Chinook had all but disappeared. There were just a few hundred left. And then four dams were removed, and a run of Chinook flourished. Now, in 2018, the Paradise Fire severely affected Butte Creek, as did the floods that immediately followed. But these Butte Creek salmon just seemed determined to show us that without the dams in place, come hell or high water, they were going to make it home. 16,000 wild spring Chinook returned to Butte Creek in 2019. And it's the largest run of wild Chinook in the state of California. I live on the White Salmon River in Washington state. In 2011, Condit Dam started to be removed. And I personally watched as a reservoir went back to a free-flowing river. It was beautiful. <laughs> My daughter and I often walk along the riverbank. Towering above us, 20 feet is the, where the water line used to be. The river's back, and it is really healthy. Native trees tower above the shoreline, the trout population is strong, and I've seen Chinook salmon spawn where they haven't been in a hundred years. As people have started to recognize the value of returning rivers to a free-flowing condition, some really big dams like these on the Snake River have come under scrutiny. Energy innovation is putting old power plants out of business, and the electricity from these Snake River dams is not needed in the Pacific Northwest. For 50 years, it was sold outside the region, mostly to California. But now, a modernized energy grid powered to a significant degree by wind and solar is fast becoming a reality. California will probably switch to, by 2045 to these renewables completely. So they're just not buying surplus Snake River hydropower like they once did. In fact, the electricity from these dams is now often sold at a loss. Removing the four lower Snake River dams is similar to removing old coal-fired power plants. Outdated technology that darkens our skies and kills our fish is just no longer necessary. Removing these four dams will save salmon, and in return, will save orcas. So now we have an opportunity. We could have back what was once one of the world's great salmon rivers. We could reinvent an energy system for the 21st century. Both economically and ecologically, we'd be better off. But in addition to the opportunity, we have an obligation. For thousands of years, the Columbia River connected the Pacific Ocean to the spine of the continent along the Great Divide. Orcas are perhaps the most exquisite expression of this weave of mountains and water, and salmon are the thread that wove this connection. We owe it to our children and grandchildren to keep intact this beautiful living tapestry that salmon has sewn together. If you feel connected to these animals, here's what you can do. Contact your representative. You can write a letter, you can make a phone call, <laughs> you can email. You could even send a text. If you get really inspired, you could put on a big fluffy orca suit and go to a rally. <laughs> but the most important thing you can do is talk to people, because the echo of your voice can save these amazing animals. On behalf of the orcas and the salmon, we can't thank you enough. <laughs>